And let's just say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to your presence, Lord, uh, through the promise that we have in your word, Lord, that wherever two or three are gathered, that the Lord Jesus is there with them. And we ask, Heavenly Father, this evening, that you direct our hearts and minds to understand, Lord, your word and to apply it in our lives, Lord, in a way that will give glory to you in these things we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like us this evening to continue our journey through the book of Genesis, and we're looking at chapter 8 to 9. Uh, eight tonight. Genesis chapter 8, and it's been a long journey with uh, Noah and his flood, but we're going to read the whole chapter. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from the heaven from heaven was restrained. And the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the waters decreased. Then the ark rested on the seventh month, the seventeenth day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So it came to pass at the end of the forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Then he sent out a raven which, was, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent out from, from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot and she returned into the ark to him for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days and again he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And no one knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out a dove which did not return again to him any more. And it came to pass on the six hundredth and first year in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters uh, would, had dried up uh, from the earth and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was, was dried. Then God spoke to Noah saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is, that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird and whatever creeps on the earth according to their families went out of the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a, a, a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. The opening words of this chapter begin with, Then God remembered Noah. Now I remember many years ago we had gone to Adelaide with uh, my wife and Tammy and Marie. I'm not sure if Billy was born at the time. And uh, we're at Steve's place, my brother-in-law's place, or at his brother-in-law's place, and um, we're going to go to Nickel Calibre Gis place. And so at some point we all jumped into the cars, everyone in the cars, everyone in the cars. We took off and went, and uh, we got there and we were comfortable there, and all of a sudden I said, where's Marie? And uh, I think I asked Simon or Steve or someone or other. I said, oh, I thought they went with you. I said, no, no, I thought they went with you because you got all the kids in the car. And all of a sudden I realised I had forgotten Marie <laughs> at Steve's place. Needless to say, we panicked. I jumped into the car and probably broke a few rules getting to Steve's place. Meanwhile, Lily had called Marie uh, at, on the home phone just to make sure she was okay and just to put her at peace. Uh, and um, Marie answered the phone because no one else was answering the phone. There was no one else there. And Lee was trying to tell her, look, your mum and dad are coming back. Marie was oblivious because Marie was into books at the time and still is. And so she was reading uh, books 
in the corner had not noticed that anyone had disappeared. Anyway, the moral of the story is, uh, or the point of the story is, I forgot Marie. All right, so um, I can be forgiven for being human and flawed and uh, preoccupied, but God remembered Noah. Had God forgotten Noah? What, what does it mean that when it opens up here and says, and God remembered Noah and every living thing of all the animals that were with him in the ark? Uh, had God forgotten Noah, who was floating on a massive ark uh, in the waters for 370 days? Uh, you know, God told him to build it. He was building it for 120 years and then to get inside. And seven days later, God closes the door and the flood waters came. 40 days of constant rain and also the waters from underneath the earth came up as well. And so it started, we're told, uh, I think in the previous chapter, on the 17th day of the second month, the rain and the waters underneath, and it, it did that for 40 days, and then God remembers Noah. Uh, 150 days had passed, and the waters started receding, and the ark rests on Mount Ararat, and th that's when God remembered Noah. Uh, God, uh, Noah, all Noah could do was to wait, not even a word from God during this period of time. And in verse 5, we're told, and the waters decreased continue until the 10th month, so this is you know, from the second month to the tenth month. On the first day of the tenth month, and the tops of the mountains were seen, and not even a word from God, uh, at least nothing recorded for us to look at. Uh, and you know, this is not um, you know, going for a long journey and you're going to meet people at the other end. This is, there's no one else on the earth, right? Everyone else has died. All the animals living and breathing on the earth had died, had passed away. So there's no one else on the planet except for the eight people that were on the ark and all the animals with them. And you, you couldn't imagine a lonelier place to be knowing you're going to come out of the ark and there's not going to be anyone there because that's what God said. So this would make for a good movie plot and I'm sure there has been some, have been some movies about an end of day type thing where there's only one or two people left. So no life on the earth except for those on the ark and I couldn't imagine a, a, um, a more terrible experience uh, than this and to feel forgotten. Um, you know, God tells you to build the ark, you're building it for 120 years, get in, you get in, and then there's silence. And you don't know what's happening outside. You hear the rain stops, and God causes the wind to start, and so the wind's blowing the waters away. And all you notice is the sound of the water lapping up on the sides of the ark, and the animals carrying on inside the ark, and you've been with the people, your family, for another 320, uh, 370 days, and you're at the point where you can finish off each other's sentences because you've run out of conversations. You know, How's the pigs today? You know, they're fine. The elephants, yeah, they're okay as well. I mean, what else do you say for 370 days within your own family? Sometimes we get tired of each other much sooner than that. 370 days. And the only thing they have is silence, right? Nothing from God. No, no word from God, nothing at all. And so at the end of the 40 days, we're told here, uh, at some point, uh, verse 6, I'm not sure, I think it's probably the end of the 40 days of the rain when the rain stopped. He sends out a raven and uh, there's no resting place for the raven. It doesn't tell us that it, come back. it came back, but probably would come back. He just kept on going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. There's no resting place. So after uh, it lands on Mount Ararat and at some point uh, uh, Noah sends out a dove and the dove comes back because it can't find anything anywhere to rest. And so he waits another seven days and sends it out again. This time it comes out with a fresh olive leaf, which means things were starting to sprout again, which is a sign of life. It's a good sign. And so the dove came back because, again, no resting place. He waits another seven days, and then this time the dove doesn't come back. And we're told on the first month of the first day, sorry, first day of the first month, uh, the water's gone. And Noah still doesn't disembark uh, from uh, the ark. He's still waiting for God who closed the door to say something, to say to him, no, just go, it's outside. So he takes the top of the ark off and he looks outside and the ground looks dry. Uh, and still no word from God. You can imagine the thoughts, right? You can imagine Noah saying, 370 days, what's happening? Where's God? Why isn't he saying something? You can imagine his son saying, Dad, why are we in the ark? You can see the ground, it's dry, let's, let's go. Or his wife saying, Noah, I told you from the beginning, you overinterpreted what God said or you know, whatever his wife may have said. Maybe God meant something else. 
Is it possible to be forgotten by God is really the question. Because there's been no word coming to Noah from God. And so on the 27th day of the second month, that's 370 days later, God speaks. And he comes. And there's no flipping trees. Hey, Noah, had to go for 370 days. Everything under control. So I was caught up, you know, making sure the plants were still going or everything else that's supposed to be happening. Sorry to keep you waiting. Look what it says in verse 16 and 17. Straight to business. Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out all, every living thing of all the flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and everything else. Well, there's no pleasantries here. It's straight to work. And at times in life, you know, God tells us to believe in him, to trust him, to persevere, to continue in our life's journey with him. At times in life, we really feel like we're forgotten by God. And it's not um, through anything that we can put our finger on and say, this is what's happening. Just it's very quiet. Uh, the daily grind, day after day after day, the same grind. And you feel like, where is God? And we have all the scriptures. I'll read some of them which tell us that you know, God hasn't forgotten us. Isaiah 49, 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, but I will not forget you. Uh, Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 12, verses 6 to 7, are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten by God. But the very hairs of your hairs are numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you have more value than the sparrows. If God doesn't forget any of the sparrows and he counts the hairs on our head, he can't forget us. And a bit later on in Isaiah, again, the same passage, 49. See, I've inscribed you or engraved you on the palms of my hands. And yet at times... And we do feel that God is distant or you know, God isn't, uh, is very quiet. He's not answering prayers. He's not speaking to us. And this is a common theme in Scripture a number of times we see it in Scripture. And David, for example, says in Psalm 43, verse 2, For you are the God of my strength. You know, there's no question about who God is. Why do you cast me off? You know, it just felt like God had just left him, had abandoned him. So at times we feel forgotten by God. We often feel well, we're forgotten by friends, even sometimes our own families you know, tend to take us for granted. Everyone's getting on with their lives, everyone's busy. Uh, sometimes you know, the thoughts in young people, everyone's getting married, having kids, they've got good jobs, a great home, careers are moving. Everyone's moved on and I'm just stuck in a rut. I'm left behind. Why aren't things working out for me? And you pray in this silence and you read your Bible and there's even more silence. There's just no easy answer coming, no obvious answer coming. And so you start questioning, does God see my struggles? Does he see my anguish? Does he see my pain, my illness? You know, what's happening with my family, my spouse, my kids? And there's difficult trials. And these trials in life often make us feel like, we won't admit that we're forsaken, but we feel like you know, something's uh, not right uh, and God is very quiet. And you often feel like a helpless child that, you know, wants to have their parents wrap their arms around them and say, oh, don't worry, I'm here, everything's okay. And despite all the support we may get from those around us, sometimes it's just not enough. You just want to know that God is by your side. He's standing there academically, theoretically, we know that. The scripture tells us that. Uh, but sometimes it, it just we don't feel that particular way. And you remember Elijah in the cave feeling sorry for himself. Yeah, he wanted to see God. He wanted to see God. When the earthquake came, he got out of his cave because he thought, that's an earthquake, that must be God, the power of God. God wasn't there. The wind came and changed the landscape. He went outside and thought, that must be God. No, God still wasn't there. And then the fire left, destroyed whatever else was left. And God still wasn't there because that's how Elijah wanted to see God, the power of God moving, doing things. And uh, in that passage, it tells us uh, that then he heard a still small voice. And that's when he heard God. Or Job in his loneliest place in life, not understanding what was happening in the supernatural world, how the de devil had targeted him, targeted him for uh, suffering and everything else. At that loneliest point, uh, he, he's asking, why is God hiding his face, his face from me? Oh, that I could find him and speak to him and present my case to him. Yeah, so it's, it's not an uncommon theme in scripture for people to feel like that. And not people distant from God, but people who God speaks highly of. Uh, and I like this verse in Psalms 61, verse 1 and 2. 
a, a cry that comes from David. I think it's from David. Uh, a cry in the depths of his heart. And he says, Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. So there's times in life when we feel that everything overwhelms us. And David finishes that prayer by saying, Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Yeah, just to lead, lead me back to you. Lean, help me, Lord, to lean back on you, to trust you and your faithfulness in everything that I'm going through because I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. And I think Noah would have, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking 370 days knowing there's not going to be anyone else outside, uh, God is silent, wondering what has happened. So when it says here, uh, God remembered Noah, let's not think he had forgotten Noah. The expression really remembered uh, doesn't have to do with forgetting as much as it has to do with, you know, we, we remember a light bulb moment and we think, oh, I've got to do that. That's not what God was doing. Remember is often used by God in the sense of taking action on his promises. So, for example, uh, with Solomon and Gomorrah, uh, in Genesis nineteen twenty nine, we read, And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that's Solomon and Gomorrah, God remembered Abraham, and the promise that he'd made to Abraham about Lot. If there's only ten righteous, Lord, will you destroy it? If there's ten, I won't. He remembered, that he remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, and he th overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. So he acted on that promise, that's what it means by he remembered Abraham. He acted on that promise and saved Lot. When Rachel couldn't bear children, it was very bitter, and complained to Jacob. And Jacob got angry with her at one point, the only point uh, that he got angry with her. And he said, what am I, God, to change the situation that, that we have before us? Uh, at some point, uh, we read uh, in Genesis 30, then God remembered Rachel and listened to and opened her womb and she conceived and bore a son and said God has taken away my reproach again God acted because there was a promise here uh, through Jacob and through Rachel uh, a promise that God had made to Abraham to Isaac and then to Jacob that the line would continue and so uh, God acted on that promise in Exodus 2 24 when the Israelites were in Egypt we read so God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He hadn't forgotten it. He thought, oh, gee, what am I doing? Uh, I've got to do something for these guys. He acted on that promise that he made, that covenant that he made. And so God takes action here with Noah, and not just Noah, the animals as well. We read in verse 1, uh, he remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. Uh, they don't rate high today animals for some people. But for God, he remembered all that life that he had created, that were creation of God, uh, and he acts uh, to deliver them, which was the plan from, from the beginning. And that's why he put them on the, the ark. He acts to deliver them, deliver them. And so this remembrance really is to act on the promise that God had made uh, to Noah, the words that God had spoken to Noah. And this remembrance really points us, uh, points us to God's faithfulness. This expression that God remembered really points us to God's faithfulness. And when we look at God's word, all his promises to us, and sometimes we wonder where they are, uh, he hasn't forgotten his people, he remembers. And he acts, and he acts in his own time. Now I like this verse in Hebrews 6.10, which says, For God is not unjust to forget the work and labour of love, in other words, to persevere and to continue to live the life that we're supposed to live, that God is not unjust to forget this. In the context here, it's working uh, to minister to the saints and uh, to continue ministering to the saints. But as a general principle, God does not forget. God acts and delivers on his promises. And we see God's faithfulness in three different ways uh, in our lives and in Scripture. The first is we see his faithfulness as it worked in the past for those that trusted in him. And so God's salvation to know in his family uh, we see it. Uh, God brought, brings judgment to the world. And now, even though he brings judgment to the world, uh, when you get down to verse 21, uh, the judgment is only a partial uh, dealing of the problem of the sinfulness within man. The, the fulfillment of dealing with this problem was to come later with Jesus Christ. And it says, 
Uh, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Okay, so God is making a declaration there that despite this judgment, man hasn't changed. It's just a, a recess which that God put, uh, pushed rather, uh, and we see God's faithfulness in delivering his people in the past. We also see it in Lot's time when uh, he delivered Lot, uh, when he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And the delivery mechanism in this situation was the ark. All on board were saved. It wasn't five-star cruise ship accommodation, but it saved them, and that was the promise that God gave to them. There was a promise of salvation many years ago, and a promise also of salvation through Jesus Christ, which was given to us 2,000 years ago, or rather fulfilled 2,000 years ago, but given much earlier. And Paul sa says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 4, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. So this was the call, uh, this rather the promise of God that Jesus Christ is faithful to deliver. To deliver us from hell, from eternal hell and also to deliver us to the glorious kingdom that awaits us when we're in Christ Jesus. So God's faithfulness in doing this, we see it in the past, we also see it fulfilled 2,000 years ago on the cross through Jesus Christ and it's fulfilled in our lives today. This journey may not always be a comfortable journey. It wasn't for Noah. It might sometimes be a very lonely journey, as it was for Noah, 370 days, and you hadn't heard God's voice once in those days. But it's a safe journey when we're in Jesus Christ. And even sometimes when we feel alone and forgotten, the Lord is near. And that's an important lesson that we get from Noah, uh, from this particular passage of Noah, that God's faithfulness in delivering his people... Uh, is real and we're, we're, the, we're the recipients of that faithfulness today the second way we see god's faithfulness is that he provides whatever we need for the day so god provided safe passage in the ark they all needed to survive they had their food for 370 days no fresh fruit or vegetables unfortunately but they survived and after the flood god provides food again they get out and they and god tells them uh, of the vegetation eat and uh, there's God providing for their needs again. And so God provides at every point in our lives whatever it is that we need. And sometimes, I remember someone telling me when I was a young, much younger bloke, uh, often God comes, uh, an opportunity comes from God in our lives and is dressed in overalls and looks like hard work. And a lot of people don't like that. Uh, a lot of people prefer a nice, easy, comfortable walk in life so a lot of times what comes uh, from god is an opportunity to trust him with our lives and that he provides all that we need as he did here uh, for noah and the promise that god made in verse 22 is that while the earth remains sea time and harvest cold and heat winter and summer and day and night shall not cease so for the alarmism that goes on today god's provision to sustain life remains strong uh, there's times when things get difficult, but it always remains strong. And every time you cut a tomato, I cut tomatoes from my garden when they're growing, but every time we cut a tomato, it's just to remind us of God's faithfulness, of this promise that God provides for all our needs. And they're physical needs. He also provides through Jesus Christ for all our spiritual needs. And you know, the New Testament is full of all the promises of all the things that God provides for us. And Although he provided in this situation, I just made this comment in passing, it's not really for, t for tonight, but he provides the vegetation. We get to chapter 9, verse 3, the next chapter, and God tells them that they're free now to consume uh, um, all meat. Every moving, thing that every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I've given you all things, even as the green herbs. The grasses, the plants, that's what he means by green herbs in the original language. And everything that lives uh, is food for you. So at this point in time, they're allowed to eat meat. Uh, so they can be consumed just as much as uh, vegetables and everything else. So for all the moralising of uh, vegans and vegetarians, uh, it's a little bit misplaced. I understand some people might not like the texture of meat or the taste of meat. 
I accept that, but meat is given by God for our consumption, so let's not make it a moral issue. So we see God's providing for them, so salvation from difficulty in the past, uh, evidence for us today, providing for the day, so again we see his provision for today, we also see his faithfulness in the security about our future. And the future is the most difficult aspect of trusting God because the present you live with and you make do and often you rely on your ability to make do and you thank God because you can still do that. And it's only when you lose that ability that you really have to trust God in the present. The past, well, the past is the past. We've come through that, not a problem. But when you look to the future and you don't know what the future holds, it's a lot more difficult to trust God. And that's Noah's situation. When he entered the ark, if God said to him, Noah, you're going to be in there for 370 days, I'm not sure what Noah would have thought uh, or what he would have said. Um, and if we're going to have enough food, uh, how are we going to control all these animals? Uh, you know, are we going to tear each other apart? Are we going to get bored to, to tears? But God doesn't give that information and he doesn't give us information about what the future holds for us. It gives us some general principles about uh, in this world you'll have tribulations, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Uh, if we ex ex reveal those tribulations to us, I'm not sure that many of us would choose the life that we have ahead of us because that's what human nature is like. Uh, and so uh, God provides, God supports, and we have to trust God being faithful for the security, for our future security. And so when Noah got off the ark, there was no one else around. And you can forgive Noah for being a bit apprehensive about what the future holds, right? Um, what's going to happen to us? You know, God wiped out everyone else when they sinned and sin was really bad. He's going to do that all over again. Uh, he's going to wipe us out. Uh, and so you can see, you, know, you can understand there'd be a bit of apprehension because you know what the future holds. It might not be water next time because it says it's not going to be water. It'll be, it might be something else. He's God. He can do it all. Uh, but many years later, uh, sorry, at this point in time, God establishes a covenant with man. I think it's in the following chapter uh, about the rainbow, uh, giving the rainbow as a sign of his promise never to destroy mankind with water again. And many years later, he establishes a covenant with man through Jesus Christ. And while God will not destroy the world again with water, judgment is coming again. Because of this word here, which says in verse 21, um, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, I won't destroy, uh, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. The problem of sin hasn't been dealt with. It's only dealt with through Jesus Christ. So judgment is coming again for all those who remain outside, not the ark, but outside of salvation that Jesus Christ offers to us today. And we see this covenant in Luke 22, verse 20. Uh, we do it every Sunday morning with the Lord's table. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. This is the new covenant that we're under. The covenant that we have in Jesus Christ. And also in Hebrews 10, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, and from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool for judgment to come. For by one offering he has perfected those who are being forever, those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us that after he said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts and in their minds I will write them. And he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. There's a new covenant now. And as long as we're in Jesus Christ and we remain with this, in this new covenant, we have the protection of God and we can trust in God's faithfulness because he's true to his word. He says that he'll continue to work for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified and those who remain in Christ Jesus. That's the work that he's doing in our lives today. And so this aspect of God's faithfulness, securing our future in eternity, isn't without our, uh, the part that we play, which is to be obedient to him, and we have all those warnings in the word of God, 
But it's tied to all those things, and this is the word, the work that Christ has continued to do in our lives today to present us before the Father that day in glory. So we see God's faithfulness in the past, we see it in the present, in his providence, and we see it also in his promises about the future, uh, being secure in Jesus Christ, uh, remaining faithful to him. And so Noah teaches us a number of valuable lessons in this chapter, chapter 8 of Genesis, uh, valuable lessons in trusting God in all things, trusting in his salvation. Yeah, it needed faith to spend 120 years building an ark in the face of all the ridicule that he copped, uh, and then to get into the ark and wait there another seven days till God closed the door. Uh, he had to trust, uh, to wait patiently and not give in to despair and the despondency, even though God said nothing for 370 days. God hadn't forgotten. But he had to trust God and learn to trust God and to do it patiently, not to be dis become despaired and discouraged. And I love the verse in 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being, who are being saved, it is the power of God. We have to trust those words. We have to believe those words. That's what God is doing in our lives. We have to trust in his salvation. We also have to be patient. Uh, we want God to answer and act and protect and solve our problems right away, immediately. Uh, Noah had to wait 370 days. Not a long time in the big scheme of things. Uh, Abraham had to wait. How long did Abraham wait before he saw a son after God's promise? Can I remember? Yeah, it was about 30 years. He had to wait 30 years before his son was born. Now, that's a long time to wait for a promise from God. But he had to trust God, and that's what we're called to do. And I remember uh, Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. I don't like referring to movies in, in sermons. The spoiled little girl, I don't know what her name was, who said, what'd you say? Daddy, I want it now, right? That's how we often are as Christians. We want things immediately. We want them now. Uh, well, we have to be patient with God because God's timing is perfect in all that he does. And the silent times often teach us to rely patiently on God. I don't know if you remember that a time when Samuel said to Saul, wait, I'll come and we'll offer sacrifice in the afternoon or late afternoon. And Saul waited and waited and he was getting agitated because Samuel wasn't anywhere to be seen and he was worried that his men were going to take off and uh, you know, things weren't going to go the right way. And so an hour before Samuel rocks up, he performs the sacrifice. And Samuel says, what have you done? Why didn't you wait? And sometimes that's, how we're, that's what we're like. We, we can't wait. We want to do things on our own. So important lesson uh, to be patient and to wait on God. And the last thing we also have to learn, we learn rather from Noah, is being grateful. Uh, the first thing that Noah did when he got off the ark, you know, he didn't I've seen photos where the Pope he gets off to land somewhere with a plane, he gets off and he kisses the ground. Well, Noah had a lot of reasons to kiss the ground, right, being 370 days in the ark. He doesn't kiss the ground, he doesn't look for a good cafe, a double shot latte, he doesn't you know, say to his family, well, come on, let's build a place to shelter. We don't know where the next storm is coming. Uh, let's take all the stuff off the ark. He gets off the ark and the first thing he does is he builds an altar. That's the first thing that he does. Um, he didn't take God's grace for granted. He didn't say, there's plenty of time, no one's going to interfere with us, there's no one else here to interfere with us, the place is safe, we've got time, I'll set everything up and then you know, we'll, we'll deal with God. But he offered sacrifices to the Holy God as an expression of a grateful heart for the salvation that God provided. Um, he approached God through a blood sacrifice, uh, and that's the way to approach God, not because of a special privilege. You know, how good am I that God chose me and my family? A uh, special privilege. No, he approached God through a blood sacrifice, and that's the first thing that he did. And I reflect on that as life today often makes us, it keeps us very busy. Too busy to pray, too busy to read God's word, too busy to come to church, too busy to do a lot of things, and even too busy to be thankful to God for all that he has provided for us and all that he continues to provide for us. Uh, God was not too busy and he acted on his promise uh, to Noah. And Noah wasn't too busy to remember God 
and to say thank you, the Lord, for offering this sacrifice. We need to approach God the same way today. You know, often we've heard it a number of times in recent times in sermons, we approach God with a list of things that we need from God and not with grateful hearts for all that God uh, has done. And we need to approach him always through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what gives us uh, the right to come before him, that we're washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 13, 15 to 16, we read, Therefore by him let us continually offer sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and share, and to share for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. So like Noah, there's a million things to do uh, to get ready to get ahead in life. And often there's a million things to do today. Let's always make time with God. He remembered us. He sent Jesus Christ into the world to die on a cross for our sins. Let's remember him every time we come before him. Every time, every day, multiple times during the day, to thank him for all that he has done for us. So in closing today, uh, at times we may feel abandoned by God, forgotten by God, and by the way, I forgot, forgot Marie then in Adelaide. Uh, and at times he seems very quiet. Let's learn to trust him and rely on him because he's given us his son and with his son, is there anything that he won't give us? May God bless his word.